Welcome back to the Global Startup Movement. I'm your host, Andrew Berkowitz. Today we have a very special episode recorded at the Blockchain for Social Impact Conference at the U.S. Institute of Peace with Quan Lei, the CEO and founder of Binkabi. Binkabi is a platform for allowing for decentralized commodity trading for farmers in emerging markets. The Binkabi platform allows for the tokenization of commodities, a marketplace for price discovery, as well as funding and liquidity options for farmers in Africa. Quan spent the early part of his career in high finance before founding Grow More X, which was an ad tech firm bringing farming know-how from Asia to Africa. And this is really where Binkabi was, was born out of, uh, where Quan was opened up to the real-life experiences of farmers as well as the need for more transparency and liquidity in the supply chain for commodities in emerging markets. So what Quan did was invent the, the barter block, which is a protocol that's designed to open up a bartering system within the crypto economics framework. Quan does a much better job of explaining this than, than I can, so I'll just pass it off to Quan Lei, the founder and CEO at Binkabee. Entrepreneurship has become a global phenomenon. Uncover the stories of entrepreneurs and investors worldwide. From Sub-Saharan Africa to Silicon Valley and beyond, here on the Global Startup Movement. Now, here's your host, Andrew Berkowitz. All right, so we are coming to you all from the U.S. Institute of Peace. I'm here with Quan Lei, the founder and CEO of Binkabee. Quan, do you maybe want to start us off with uh, your story just le- leading up to... Uh, one, the, the creation of the, of the protocol that, that unlocked this opportunity um, and just the, um, the idea behind Binkabee. Sure. It's great to be here. And thank you very much for your patience uh, to, throughout the conference. So the idea of Binkabi uh, is actually originated about seven years ago when I started a company that focused on technology and engineering advisory work for agriculture projects in Africa. Uh, we started with a very simple premise of uh, actually bring proven technologies in some of the commodities that Africa needs need the most in terms of rice, cassava, cashew nuts, fish, from uh, places that produce a lot, uh, which is in Southeast Asia, where I come from, to uh, and bring these technologies to Africa. And throughout the seven years, we have been able to work with many projects directly with farmers, uh, helping investors to set up greenfield projects. Um, in West Africa, uh, so all the country from Nigeria to Ghana, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Guinea, um, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Senegal, many uh, uh, countries during that period. So um, my background is actually not in agriculture. So my background was in finance. So I spent 15 years working for a firm called PwC, started uh, in Vietnam where I graduated uh, from. Uh, uh, where I worked until 2011 and just before I left we work on resolving the uh, consequence or the impact of the financial crisis uh, especially in relation to uh, the banking crisis in Nigeria. So what I saw was uh, the issues in the uh, agriculture supply chain is not just uh, limited to the fact that Africa doesn't produce uh, enough food or the, uh, the, the, or the uh, yield is not high enough, but also there's multiple issues in the agriculture supply chain. For example, what we classify them into friction, funding, and fairness. Uh, and I can talk uh, a bit more about that. But the first-hand experience of actually working with farmers on the field and applying this technology, including uh, you know, the latest technology in terms of drones, mapping the field, really give me the perspective to be able to start uh, Minkabi, which is using the power of the blockchain technology to resolve issues in the commodity supply chain uh, in emerging markets, right. starting with agriculture. And so in, in your years working um, with, with this drone technology in Africa, I mean, what, what, what exactly were um, the drone tech, what, what value was it bringing to the farmers? And I mean, what, what impact do you think drone technology can have on just uh, the broad array of, of, of farmers in, uh, in emerging markets. Sure. So the drone technology is uh, an example where we pair one of the latest technology in agriculture 
uh, with a proven know-how so uh, in, in agriculture. So for example, the proven know-how is, you know, if you're cultivating rice, you have to make sure that you have irrigation system. You have to make sure that the field is uh, very well um, leveled. You have to make sure that there's a right, <coughs> right uh, seed and, and fertilizers. So those are the proven know-how that we brought from Southeast Asia and Vietnam, where I'm from. Where the drone technology comes in is actually, it helps the adoption of those proven know-how. So for example, uh, instead of spending months of uh, using traditional surveying equipment to map the field, we can use drone which can map the field uh, 400 hectares in an hour. So instead of spending months of mapping the field, we can reduce that into days or weeks. So that is how we can then understand the terrain uh, of the field that we are working on in order to engineer or to design the, the, the water engineering solutions that is appropriate to it. So the drone technology actually help to accelerate the adoption of the proven know-how. Right, that makes sense. So with, your, so, so with this newest company, you are using the uh, protocol for bartering that, that you actually in, invented, correct? That's right. Yeah. So, um, so uh, Binkabi uh, is uh, has has two propositions. One is uh, a cross-border commodity trading platform that enable direct um, trading. So, with our middleman. And, and what? But, and who are the parties that are trading those those, those commodities? So, the parties uh, who are currently trading uh, the importer and exporters. Okay. But a lot of the time, they have to go through so-called middleman in order to be connected to each other. What we want to do is to reduce or uh, in some case eliminate unnecessary uh, intermediary layers between the end buyer and the end sellers so that there are more profits to be distributed along the supply chain. But we also notice, and this comes from my personal experience of working in markets like Nigeria, we also notice that actually the settlement of international trade in US dollars actually inflicts high costs on the participants. Um, so for example, if I was somebody from Vietnam, I export rice to Nigeria, then when I receive, uh, then my Nigerian buyer have to convert his Naira into dollars and then send it to me. And in my country, I have to convert US dollars back to Vietnamese dong. So every trade actually involves two conversions of U.S. dollars um, to, uh, into local currencies or vice versa, uh, making um, the, 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 the profit uh, and, and the cost actually a lot higher. Um, so our, our partner bank, which is Ecobank uh, in Nigeria, uh, in Africa, estimated the cost to be between 7 and 10 percent. So you can imagine uh, 7 and 10 percent of trade value could be you know, 50 to 100 percent of profits. So we recognize the issue of um, intermediaries and the issues of um, over reliance on U.S. dollars are actual frictions in trade among developing countries. And you so that that is how we're solving that with uh, our first proposition called the butter block. Okay. Well, I guess talk a little bit about the, um, the, the protocol itself. I don't want to get into too, too many uh, technical details, yeah. but what is the, the innovation in the, the protocol layer that allows yeah. bartering uh, over blockchain? So the second proposition that we have is what we call a protocol for tokenization of commodities. So this is where um, we can actually turn commodities into a blockchain token that basically open up much wider market for these uh, tokens to work. Uh, so the way we do that is to get farmers to bring their commodities to a warehouse, get uh, a warehouse receipt issued for them, and we tokenize the warehouse receipt, uh, and that becomes instantly, instantly tradable. Um, so once it's on the blockchain, you and I sitting in America or Europe, we can see it, we can uh, invest in it, you can trade it. So the innovation here is to unlock the liquidity of the supply chain assets because otherwise farmers find it very, very difficult for them to be able to sell their produce at high price. Because what happens is farmers 
um, typically have to borrow at the beginning of uh, of the sort of um, cropping cycle, and as soon as it's harvest, they have to sell it because um, there's no other way to for them to repay the debt that they already borrow. Uh, and when there's a lot of you know sellers and only a few buyers at harvest, the price get them often get depressed unless it's a really bad harvest. So the innovation here is, is to allow farmers to actually uh, convert their commodity into a tokens where they can sell to wider market, so hopefully getting higher price, but also uh, if they don't want to sell, they can use the token as collateral to borrow money so that they can repay the debt or send their kids to school, you know, improve their lives while waiting for higher price to to, to pay, right. to sell. Are you finding that a lot of the problems that <clears throat> farmers face in Africa are the same exact problems that are faced in Southeast Asia as well? Uh, not necessarily. Farmers in Southeast Asia facing different kind of problems. They still face the problem of illiquidity of their produce. So the tokenization protocol will still on, on so be helpful to them. So it's the same issue of you know having a much wider market but they also face other problems of overproducing. So the farmers in uh, Africa often not produce enough, uh, but farmers in Southeast Asia produce too much. And often they, because of oversupply, they actually have to burn their crops or actually get their crop being eaten by animals and so on, because it's just too low a price that they can actually sell the crops for. So the issue there is connectivity with the market, get, getting information, feedback from the market so that can guide their production so that they are not overproducing. But also the issue of having a wider market so that they can sell the produce to and get a higher price. Right. So you just finished up a, um, called a, a crypto tour of Southeast Asia. And yeah. you wrote in, that, in your, your Medium blog that you, you saw that Vietnam was actually one of the most active countries when it comes to, uh, to to buying and selling crypto, uh, I'd be curious to learn more about that and just you know what 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 did you learn? What did you see on on this journey to these uh, different Asian markets? Well, we what we found is that certainly there's kind of different approach by regulators in different market when it comes to cryptocurrency. So we were in China, and obviously the Chinese government were very supportive of blockchain technology, but they actually banned ICO which is a, a, a fundraising mechanism for blockchain projects. Whereas um, markets like uh, Singapore or Vietnam, where the government is still thinking about it, they, they say they need to set up working groups in order to decide whether or not to promote cryptocurrencies. Uh, almost everyone promote blockchain technology, uh, but blockchain, blockchain and cryptocurrency do not mean the same thing. So you have Bitcoin, which is a cryptocurrency. It is based on blockchain technology, but but you know a, a, a blockchain-based project need not to be a cryptocurrency project. So what we found in Vietnam is an environment where there are a lot of younger people very enthusiastic about the technology, both from the supply side, which is the projects that utilize the technologies to improve lives or improve um, technology development, but also on the demand side in terms of investors who are willing to, to participate in those ICOs or blockchain projects, either coming from Vietnam or globally. Yeah. So we found that very interesting. The other market we found interesting is Singapore, where they have um, very open and very uh, um, uh, encouraging environment for blockchain and ICO projects. And in fact, a lot of the projects coming out of Vietnam is incorporated in Singapore. But the government also very forthcoming, uh, forward thinking in terms of creating uh, projects like Project Ubin, where they can actually uh, issue uh, Singaporean dollars on the blockchain. And we really think that is the kind of the future because um, that will solve many, many problems um, and have a very balanced approach towards uh, blockchain technology. Right. And, and what about these, uh, the, the farmers that you're working with or that you've kind of communicated with in, in Nigeria or in certain areas of Southeast Asia? I mean, are they 
do they understand kind of what you're trying to build with, with Binkaby? And I mean, how do you kind of communicate that to them? Um, they, they may not understand what we're trying to build, but everyone under, understand money and everyone understand savings. So if we say to them that, okay, by trading on our platform, you can save or you can, you can earn more or you can save more transaction costs, then everyone got that. No one cares whether it's blockchain or any kind of technology behind it. The user experience has to be uh, good, but it's not the only um, sort of parameters that people will judge uh, a, a project. It's really the benefit that the project can actually provide to the people. So even if the user experience is not so great, but people know that by participating in the project, they can make savings or they can earn more for their produce, then they would go at length to be involved in the project. Right. And so what, what, other, um, what other markets in, in Africa are you, uh, are you interested in, in entering right now besides Nigeria? Or, or is that the kind of hyper-focus right now? So yes, the hyper-focus for us is Nigeria because it's, uh, it's one, you know, one of the largest economy uh, with the biggest population in Africa. Uh, it's also a place where there's a lot of young entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurial people who wants to use the power of technology to improve their lives. Uh, so we feel that we uh, actually have a very um, supportive com community in, in, in Nigeria. Um, so we just finished a, a meetup a couple of nights ago and um, the feedback was very, very good. And the questions coming from the audience was very, very uh, good and smart. So we feel Nigeria is a good market for us. Uh, apart from Nigeria, we, we're also looking at other markets in West Africa, uh, but also specifically in Southeast Asia. Yeah. Before this company, you, you know, you, you, you've worked in a lot of places in the world, Africa, Southeast Asia, Europe. Um, you know, what are some of the other, other industries, other areas where uh, you're super excited about the applications of, of blockchain? Um, there's many, oh, I can only speak in terms of the commodity supply chain, which um, I don't understand the most. Uh, there, there are many issues along the supply chain. Some issues are more consumer centric. Uh, for example, the traceability of the, the, the food that consumer in the West actually eat. Uh, some, some issues are more sort of farmers in emerging market uh, centric, like how do I improve uh, my yield? Um, how do I reduce post-harvest loss? But the, the issues that excited the, uh, for us would, would be the mother of many issues is the access and the cost of finance. So uh, through Binkabi, we hope to play our part in terms of unlocking this liquidity uh, in the supply chain assets such that the farmers and other supply chain players can actually access finance at reasonable costs. Right. So yeah. that is what uh, um, makes us excited about the power of the blockchain technology um, because we believe that it has the um, for foundational or transformational power for emerging markets, much more, much more so compared to developed markets. Right. And I think that you know, one thing that one area that I've seen blockchain be able to, to really change lives is just access to credit uh, because the traditional brick and, brick and mortar infrastructure of the of the banking system didn't scale very well in, in emerging markets especially to rural communities right and that's where you know I see blockchain being will come in and actually because it's just software scaling and provide like providing access yeah. to finance so to at, farmers. Yet at the um, at the side of the conference someone came to me approached me and, and and saying that they are working specifically in microfinance solutions and microfinance solutions are tag you know, geared towards um, rural populations, farmers, and so on. But even with microfinance solutions, they find it very difficult to actually have a cost-effective way of acquiring customers or servicing those customers. So the the power of the technology here is that, uh, and and for for a lot of financial institutions, for banks and so on, um, they have uh, they have been encouraged by their governments to 
lend to the farming sector, but also the SME sectors. But they find find it very, very difficult and unprofitable for them to do so. So if there was a platform that kind of helped them to aggregate these um, customers and interests, then they would participate very willingly. And therefore, the access to finance can be improved. Right. So the, that is the power of the, 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 the technology to actually reduce the customer acquisition costs so that other players like financial institutions or microfinance institutions can actually um, profitably participate in, in, in the ecosystem. Right. Well, Kwan, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. Be sure to add Andrew on Snapchat at andberk, that's A-N-D-B-E-R-K, to see firsthand a day in the life of an entrepreneur in cities all around the world.